They say that these woodlands contain the path to paradise itself. It has been a long way to reach these mystical gardens. My knees are scraped and bloodied from the various thorns nipping at my legs along the path. Snakes and sirens were attempting to seduce me with their allure, but I refused to heed their calling. I was pure at heart, unspoiled by all temptation and evil. My path was blocked by something swaying back and forth from a tree. I looked at it closely. I could make out a face with long black hair and some dark colored stubble leading down its chin. Its head was cast down with closed eyes. It was a dead man hanging from a tree. I walked closer to it in disbelief and fear. What would a hanged man be doing here on the trail to heaven? I looked at its face when it suddenly jerked its head up towards me. I jumped back in shock. The man opened his eyes, blank and pitiless. He turned his gaze upon me. He opened his mouth to speak, his message quiet and choked, and whispered this. Perfection is the great abyss. Leave now lest you share my fate. A ghost dangling at heaven's gate. With his warning spoken, the dead man hung idle once more. I tried to speak to him, confused and distraught about what he meant by punishment, but I received no further response from him. I looked at him with confused frustration in response to his equivocation. What was there to fear about paradise? I am certainly not on the wrong path. I was free of all man's sins and malice. Surely they would let me pass. Maybe the man was a sinner and was being punished for trying to reach grace? Without heeding the deceased man's warning, I started to walk past the hanged man, impelled by curiosity pertaining to his cryptic prophecy. Surely there was nothing to fear. I walked through the sycamores and the blushes, my knees scraped once more from the wild, torturous prickles feeling something not unlike that of a thousand tiny quills of a porcupine seeping their way into my legs. I could only hope that whatever lied at the end of this path would be worth it. I disregarded the serpent's temptations and trickery. I walked past the trees into a clearing and found it. At last, the pearl doors. I slowly walked towards them, with caution, remembering what the man who spoke to me warned. The doors had a latch, and there was a gate aside them. I held onto the gate and looked through to see the inside of divinity before going inside. The view was marvelous. Inside, there were large grass fields aligned with a graceful night sky. The stars shone brightly around the blue orb that was the earth itself. I looked around and I was awestruck at its divine, stunning beauty. I kept looking through and through at its elegance. But one thing troubled me greatly. There was not a single person inside. With a small amount of hesitation, I wrapped my hand around the latch of the doors carefully. I tried opening it, foolishly expecting it to simply open with a gentle pull. But it did not budge. I tried pulling harder, and the door stood firm in utter defiance. I finally pulled with all my might, and I suddenly fell back to the ground. 
I looked at my hand. It had the latch inside my palm. But the doors remained unopened. I cursed under my breath and held onto the bars futilely. I tried shaking angrily at the gate and was looking inside, almost sobbing at the fact that Paradise was not letting me inside. That was when I saw a flash of fire as the gate suddenly began to burn. I screamed in pain and looked at my hands holding the gate, horrifically burned. I ran back into the orchids and newfound fear and terror of this hellish heaven. I came across a waterfall and I dived in quickly to ease off the pain. I quickly washed my wounds in the water, gagging at the sight of loose, burnt flesh coming off into the water. That was when the screaming began. A thousand different voices, male and female of every age and in between, writhing in agony. They were moaning. I looked around and saw many in funeral pall, while others simply hung from the trees. I counted the leaves in one tree, the largest, while covering my ears. I then counted the trail of dead bodies and found that the two numbers were matching. All of the different voices were crying out for one thing, a second chance. They wanted to escape these woods. I tried covering my ears, but to no avail. They beckoned me to save them, to guide them onto the path of redemption. I backed up and hit the trunk of the tree that I counted off earlier, and something lowered itself down in front of me. An empty noose. With a swift movement, it wrapped itself around my neck suddenly. Its pole was that of a lover's, lifting me, mother gently off of the ground. It was a soothing feeling, that of which a lover wrapped their arms around your neck. Soon, my legs began to dangle uselessly underneath me, no longer standing. I realized that I was on the wrong path to immortality after all. My life started to transmute into all life. The pulling of my neck tightened slightly, and soon all vice and ill thoughts of mankind began to leave me behind as my vision faded into the blackening nothingness. This all happened about a month ago, and I just remembered it. I will not be playing Don't Starve Again until that thing is out of my game. I had finally survived until day 1000 after playing as Wilson. I had entire rooms of food, loot, and armor. I was getting manure from my world savanna when I noticed something that wasn't there before. A long piece of land going out into the ocean made of wooden tiles. I assumed it was supposed to be a bridge and I followed it. It took around 10 days, in game, to get to the end. About half of my supplies were gone at that point. At the end was a small island. There was a fire pit and a divining rod surrounded by lumpy evergreens. I walked up to the pit, and the divine rod started to talk. It said, Say, pal, things are going great for you. I got more knowledge in store, if you want it. A yes or no option appeared. I assumed the person was Maxwell, 
and after seeing the Forbidden Knowledge video, I decided to click no, which caused it to say this line. So you don't trust me, I see. Shame. Well, if you ever change your mind, the offer stands. I went back to my camp, thinking it as a huge waste of time. I went to bed, seeing as it was late. I went back the next morning, as overnight. I couldn't help but think of what it could be. I went back to the island, and this time selected yes. But, as expected, I got tricked. The voice said, <laughs> You fall for it again. The screen went pitch black, and when it came up again, Wilson was in a room with none of his items, and his beard shaved. A campfire was at embers. I tried to walk to the left, but it was just a stone wall. Red text appeared saying, Wilson, why don't you meet your new roommate? He's been waiting for you for some time now. Once the text went away, a set of glowing, red eyes appeared across the campfire. Wilson started to hold his head up, like characters do when they go insane, and kept repeating, Wake me up! Please! Can't you hear me? At this point, I was disturbed, as it seemed a bit messed up for Don't Starve. The fire eventually burned out, and my health was set to one. Wilson kept saying his lines as a ticking clock was heard. It ticked three times before the voice said, Time's up. I heard a scream through my headphones, obviously of a live human. My game crashed, and there was a new file on my desktop. It was a picture file with no name. I clicked on it, and it was an image of Wilson's mutilated dead body, plastered to the wall by a black substance I could only assume was nightmare fuel. I felt like vomiting. I was wondering if this was a hidden addition, or some kind of sick joke. I went back into the game on the same world. I was back in my camp. It was dusk for roughly five seconds before it was night. I made a fire as fast as I could, accidentally maxing it. A message then appeared, saying, The Gru no longer fears the light of day. I couldn't help but think to myself, What is going on? A few seconds later, a roar sounded. I heard my tooth trap entrance go off. I got a torch and went to see what it was. It was horrible. A emasculated black creature with demonic red eyes on two legs with sharp claws was standing there. I examined it and Wilson said, it's not scared anymore. Oh, God. I went back and got an amulet to kill it. It was now morning, and it was still there, just watching. I wanted to see how strong it was before I tried to fight it, so I opened up the console and spawned in a deer clops. The deer clops, however, died in only one hit. The Gru waited about 20 hits or so before attacking the deer clops, meaning it had a lot of hell. I went back and I decided I would just wait until it lost interest. I gave up, however, after I was down to my last meaty stew after a good amount of days spent on the game. Every 20 days or so, during that time, Wilson would only say one thing. I'm only delaying the inevitable.
The following is transcribed directly from documents found in an abandoned German test lab by American soldiers during the aftermath of World War II, roughly translated into English. Voice recording number one. Our testing is to begin tomorrow. The team does not know what to expect. Our mission is to take up new research and turn it into a weapon for the war front. It has recently been discovered that the brain releases a chemical when feeling fear. For obvious reasons, this test could be extremely dangerous. Two test subjects have been selected, and from what we were told, they were sentenced to death, but are going to instead be used as subjects in this experiment. Subjects are given a table with two chairs, a cot with a mattress, a stocked bookcase, a notebook and a pen, and a bathroom area, consisting of a toilet, a sink, and a mirror. Food and water are given through a small, sealable opening. I have nothing more to report at this time. Written document number one. Test subject A and B have been given the chemical in a small dose, mixed with water. Test subject A has consumed the water and has shown no visible changes in mood nor behavior. Test subject B has refused to drink the water. He's been forcefully given the same dosage, but by direct injection. He gave some resistance, but was easily controlled and injected. Shortly afterward, he seemed nervous, almost paranoid, and jumped whenever he heard sudden noises. Subjects have been told to try and remain active or sleep, just not to remain idle. Written document number two. It took time, but we have developed a gas-based version of the chemical. If shown effective on subjects, this could become a valuable weapon. Dosage has been increased slightly. Neither subjects were aware that the chemical was being let into the room. After a few minutes, subject A stopped reading and began to look around the room, cautiously. After an estimated hour, he began to read again. Subject B immediately responded. He opened the notebook for the first time and wrote, what is going on? Stop, stop whispering to me. I don't want to hear you. Onto a piece of paper, ripped it out of the textbook, and slipped it under the door. No reply was given. Written document number three. We are going to observe the effects of long-term, low amounts of the gas on subject A, and we are going to observe the effects of a short, but high amount of gas on subject B. The results are shocking, to say the least. Subject A progressively became more unstable. He stopped reading, would not eat, and avoided the mirror at all costs. He suddenly became very aggressive and threw a heavy book at the mirror with surprising force, shattering it. Subject B's reaction was more curious. He began staring at the second chair, but he was not looking at the chair. He was looking as if he was making eye contact with someone who was sitting in the chair. Something seems to be amiss, but we were definitely getting results. The Fuhrer will be most pleased. Voice recording number two. We don't want this. What did we do to deserve vengeance such as this? Subject B has escaped from his cell. The chair he was staring at was thrown across the room, straight into the viewing glass, instantly shattering it. It was five inches thick, reinforced. He didn't even touch the chair. He has escaped out of the hole made by the impact.
The vents are leaking the gas into the rest of the facility. The power has gone offline, and he has killed most of our gut. No! 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 Please! The rest of the tape is silence. One final note was found. It seemed to be hastily written and is barely legible. They are dead. Every one of them. I hear him in the walls. I hear him whispering to me. (laughs) Yes, yes, please come take me away. I want no more of them. And the note ends there. The rest who soaked in blood to read. In April 23, 1944, Allied soldiers found an abandoned German laboratory with its only door sealed shut. Using explosive charges, they forcefully entered the laboratory, wondering what was so important that the Germans had to lock it away. They found 13 bodies, 12 of which had matching lab coats on, mangled to pieces, and in one case, ripped straight in half. The thirteenth body had nondescript brown clothing and no head. A larger scale investigation was launched later by the Germans as to determine what had happened, but was cancelled after many German soldiers absolutely refused to return to the laboratory, even if threatened with their lives. To this day, nobody knows exactly what happened to Subject B but he is presumed dead. I just want to start off by saying, if you want an answer at the end, prepare to be disappointed. There just isn't one. I was an intern at Nickelodeon Studios for a year in 2005 for my degree in animation. It wasn't paid, of course. Most internships aren't. But it did have some perks beyond education. To adults, it might not seem like a big one, but most kids at the time would go crazy over it. Now, since I worked directly with the editors and animators, I got to view the new episodes days before they aired. I'll get right to it without giving too many unnecessary details. They had very recently made the Spongebob movie, and the entire staff was somewhat sapped of creativity, so it took them longer to start up the season. But the delay lasted longer for more upsetting reasons. There was a problem with the Series 4 premiere that set everyone and everything back for several months. Me and two other interns were in the editing room, along with the lead animators and sound editors for the final cut. We received the copy that was supposed to be Fear of a Krabby Patty and gathered around the screen to watch. Now given that this isn't final yet, animators often put up a mock title card, sort of an inside joke for us, with phony, oftentimes lewd titles, such as How Sex Doesn't Work, instead of Rockabye Bivel, when Spongebob and Patrick adopt a sea scallop. Nothing particularly funny, but work-related chuckles. So when we saw the title card, Squidward Suicide, we didn't think it more than just a morbid joke. One of the interns even did a small throat laugh at it. The happy-go-lucky music plays, as is normal. The story began with Squidward practicing his clarinet, hitting a few sour notes like normal, We hear Spongebob laughing outside, and Squidward stops, yelling at him to keep it down as he has a concert that night and needs to practice. Spongebob says okay, and goes to see Sandy with Patrick. The bubble splash screen comes up, and we see the ending of Squidward's concert. 
This is when things began to seem off. While playing, a few frames repeat themselves, but the sound doesn't. At this point, sound is synced up with animation, so yes, that's not common. But when he stops playing, the sound finishes as if the skip never happened. There is a slight murmuring in the crowd before they begin to boo him. Not normal cartoon booing that is common in the show, but you could very clearly hear malice in it. Squidward's in full frame and looks visibly afraid. The shot goes to the crowd with Spongebob in center frame, and he too is booing, very much unlike him. That isn't the oddest thing though. What is odd is everyone had hyper-realistic eyes, very detailed. Clearly not shots of real people's eyes, but something a bit more real than CGI. The pupils were red. Some of us looked at each other, obviously confused, but since we weren't the writers, we didn't question its appeal to children. Yet. The shot goes to Squidward, sitting on the edge of his bed, looking very forlorn. The view out of his porthole window is that of a night sky, so it isn't very long after the concert. The unsettling part is, at this point, is that there is no sound. Literally, no sound. Not even the feedback from the speakers in the room. It's as if the speakers were turned off, though their status showed them working perfectly. He just sat there, blinking in the silence for about 30 seconds. Then he started to sob softly. He put his hands or tentacles over his eyes and cried quietly for a full minute more. All the while, a sound in the background, very slowly growing from nothing to barely audible. It sounded like a slight breeze through a forest. The screen slowly begins to zoom in on his face. By slow, I mean it's only noticeable if you look at the shots, 10 seconds apart, side by side. His sobbing gets louder, more full of hurt and anger. The screen then twitches a bit, as if it twists in on itself for a split second, then back to normal. The wind through the trees sound gets slowly louder and more severe, as if a storm is brewing somewhere. The eerie part is, this sound and Squidward sobbing sounded real, as if the sound wasn't coming from the speakers, but as if the speakers were holes that the sound was coming through. As good a sound as the studio likes to have, they don't purchase the equipment to be that good to produce sound of that quality. <laughs> Below the sound of the wind and sobbing, very faint, something sounded like laughing. It came at odd intervals and never lasted more than a second, so you had a hard time pinning it. We watched this show twice, so pardon me if things sound too specific, but I've had time to think about them. After 30 seconds of this, the screen blurred and twitched violently as something flashed over the screen, as if a single frame was replaced. The lead animation editor paused and rewound frame by frame. What we saw was... horrible. It was a still photo of a dead child. He couldn't have been more than six. The face was mangled and bloody. One eye dangling over his upturned face popped. He was naked down to his underwear, his stomach crudely cut open and his entrails lying beside him. He was lying on some pavement that was probably a road. The most upsetting part was that there was a shadow of the photographer. There was no crime tape, no evidence tags or markers, and the angle was completely off for a shot designed to be evidence. It would seem the photographer was the person responsible for the child's death. We were, of course, mortified, but pressed on, hoping that it was just some sick joke. The screen flipped back to Squidward, still sobbing, <laughs> louder than before, and half-body in frame. There was now what appeared to be blood running down his face from his eyes. The screen was also done in a hyper-realistic style, looking as if you touched it, 
you would get blood on your fingers. The wind sounded now as if it were that of a gale blowing through the forest. There were even snapping sounds of branches. The laughing, a deep baritone lasting at longer intervals and coming more frequently. After about 20 seconds, the screen again twisted and showed a single frame photo. The editor was reluctant to go back. We all were, but he knew he had to. This time, the photo was that of what appeared to be of a little girl, no older than the first child. She was lying on her stomach, her barrettes in a pool of blood next to her. Her left eye was too popped out and popped, naked except for underpants. Her entrails were piled on top of her, above another crude cut along her back. Again, the body was on the street, and the photographer's shadow was visible, very similar in size and shape to the first. I had to choke back vomit, and one intern, the only female in the room, ran out. The show resumed. About five seconds after the second photo played, Squidward went silent, as did all sound, like it was when the scene first started. He put his tentacles down. His eyes were now done in hyperrealism, like the others were in the beginning of this episode. They were bleeding, bloodshot, and pulsating. He just stared at the screen, as if watching the viewer. After about 10 seconds, he started <laughs> sobbing, this time not covering his eyes. The screen was now piercing and loud, and most fear-inducing of all is his sobbing was mixed with screams. Tears and blood were dripping down his face at a heavy rate. The wind sound came back, and so did the deep voice laughing. And this time, the still photo lasted for a good five frames. The animator was able to stop it on the fourth and backed up. This time the photo was of a boy, about the same age, but this time, the scene was different. The entrails were just being pulled out from a stomach wound by a large hand. The right eye popped and dangling, blood trickling down it. The animator proceeded. It was hard to believe, but the next one was different, but we couldn't tell what. He went on to the next, same thing. He went back to the first and played them quicker. And I lost it. I vomited on the floor. The animating and sound editors gasping at the screen. The five frames were not played as if there were five different photos. They were being played out as if they were frames from a video. We saw the hands slowly lift out the guts. We even saw the kid's eyes begin to focus on it. We even saw two frames of the kid beginning to blink. The lead sound editor told us to stop. He had to call in the creator to see this. Mr. Hillenberg arrived within about 15 minutes. He was confused as to why he was called down there, so the editor just continued the episode. Once the few frames were shown, all screaming, all sound again stopped. Squibber was just staring at the viewer, full frame of the face for about three seconds. The shot quickly panned out, and that deep voice said, And we see in Squibber's hands, a shotgun. He immediately puts the gun in his mouth and pulls the trigger. <laughs> Realistic blood and brain matter splatters the wall behind him and his bed, and he flies back with a force. The last five seconds of this episode show his body on the bed, on his side, one eye dangling on what's left of his head above the floor, staring blankly at it. Then the episode ends. Mr. Hillenberg is obviously angry at this, he demanded to know what the heck was going on. Most people left the room at this point, so it was just a handful of us to watch it again. Viewing the episode twice only served to imprint the entirety of it in my mind and caused me horrible nightmares. I'm sorry I stayed. The only theory we could think of was that the file was edited by someone in the chain from the drawing studio to hear. The CTO was called in to analyze when it happened. The analysis of the file did show it was edited over by new material. However, the timestamp of it was a mere 24 seconds before we began watching it. 
All equipment involved was examined for foreign software and hardware, as well as glitches, as if the timestamp may have been glitched and showed the wrong time. But everything checked out fine. We don't know what happened, and to this day, nobody does. There was an investigation due to the nature of the photos, but nothing came of it. No child seen was identified, and no clues were gathered from the data involved, nor the physical clues in the photos. I never believed in unexplainable phenomena before, but now that I've had something happen and can't prove anything about it beyond anecdotal evidence, I think twice about things. Hey everyone, I just want to take a moment and properly say thank you to all of the people who go to such great lengths in giving me the tools to produce my content. Thank you to people like Muji and Kevin McLeod for their music, the people who set the tone for all of my readings. Thank you for all the authors of the creepypastas I have read and will read for gifting me with the foundation of this channel. Thank you to all those who have stood by my side as I have grown in this field and have picked me up when I was falling down. Thank you to the always amazing Amethyst for the art she provides that gives my channel more life. And most importantly, I thank all of you, the viewers, as it is because of you I am motivated to keep pushing forward. It's because of you I can have pride in my work. And it's because of you that I can log onto my YouTube page every day and have the privilege to see that there are over 200 of you that eagerly await to see my next reading. Thank you to each and every one of you. I can't help but be excited to see what the future holds for all of us here.